Hi, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I want to talk about upper mantle melting. What's key to how melting occurs in part is related to how the mantle is zoned mineralogically with respect to aluminum bearing phases. So the three key phases are garnet, spinel, and plagioclase. The upper part of the mantle consists of peridotites. Peridotites are ultramafic rocks that contain olivine, pyroxene, and something else. And that something else is the aluminous phase. At low pressures, less than 20 kilometers, the aluminous phase is plagioclase, so solid solution between albite and anorthite, low density. At intermediate pressures, the aluminous phase is spinel, so dominantly MgAl204 with a pretty high density. And then at higher pressures, the aluminous phase is garnet. And so we talk about different kinds of peridotites. So this is now pressure versus temperature. So temperature increasing downward, pressure increasing downward. In the shallow mantle, we have plagioclase. In the intermediate part of the upper mantle, we have spinel. And in the deeper part of the mantle, we have garnet. Orthopyroxene also contains some aluminum, so that's what we're looking at here. This is the weight percent of aluminum in orthopyroxene that increases with increasing temperature. And so there are regions where orthopyroxene is actually the dominant aluminous phase. Now, the problem in trying to get the mantle to melt is that the typical geotherm in the mantle, so this is the distribution of temperature as a function of depth or pressure, that the geotherm is not near the melting curve. This is the melting curve. So over here, the mantle can be melted. And over here, it cannot. And so the question then becomes, how does the mantle ever melt? So here's a simplified diagram. So this, again, is temperature increasing to the right, pressure increasing downward, depth increasing downward. So this is our normal geotherm. This is the solidus above here. There's melting below here. The rock is solid. So in the shallow mantle, it's lithosphere. The mantle is stiff and conductive. Here it's convecting, not necessarily melted, not necessarily containing melt. It could be below the solidus, but it's hot enough that it's actually circulating around. And so the question then becomes, how do we get this solidus and this geotherm to intersect? OK, well, there are three possibilities for this. One is, here's our same pressure temperature. Here's our normal geotherm. Here's the normal melting curve. Well, one possibility is they're just hot regions in the mantle. Hot spots are an example of that, where the deep mantle is hotter than normal. So it is not a normal geotherm. It's an elevated geotherm. And if the elevated geotherm intersects the solidus, then there can be melting. This is usually pretty deep, but it is possible to get melting this way. A more common way of melting is to have upwelling. So what upwelling does is it takes this geotherm and shifts it upwards. Now when that happens, the steeper geotherm can intersect the solidus, and we can get melting in this region. Now notice this is much shallower melting than the temperature effect. You can think of it as a temperature effect. It's hotter here, closer to the surface, than it is in a normal geotherm, but the reason is because hot materials are being moved upward. It's not that the actual temperature structure of the mantle has been significantly shifted here. It's just been moved upward. And then there's a third way, and that is to say, well, OK, this is the solidus. This is the melting line for peridotite, dry peridotite. What happens if we add water to it? Well, if we add water to it, the solidus shifts to a shape that looks like this. And it's possible for this solidus to intersect a normal geotherm to create melting. Actually, it could intersect a cooler geotherm and still create melting. And that's what happens in subduction zones. We'll talk about that in a, in a later class. But it is the addition of water that lowers the solidus temperature that allows melting to, to occur. And again, this is not a shallow phenomenon. The shallowest phenomenon is actually during upwelling. And so this is the kind of thing that happens at mid-ocean ridges. And remember, it's the aluminum and calcium-rich minerals that melt first. So 
Usually it's something like spinel or garnet and clinopyroxene that's melting with some orthopyroxene and little olivine too. So what does this mean in terms of what kinds of peridotites are melting? Well, remember plagioclase is stable only at very shallow levels. And although upwelling does occur to create melting at relatively shallow levels, it's rarely in the plagioclase peridotite field. Most of the time, it's in the spinel peridotite field, something on the order of 30 to 50 kilometers. Subduction zones tend to be deep, and these deeper forms of melting can include garnet rather than spinel, because they form it at deeper levels where garnet is stable rather than spinel. Now, how are you going to remember plagioclase, spinel, garnet? Which of these is shallow? Which one's deep? So to help you remember, I created a little song, and it's based on, these are some of my favorite things. Remember Sound of Music and Julie Andrews? Okay, so here's a go. Here's, here's how you remember it. There's a little bit of extra to deal with the deep mail. Okay, here we go. Garnet is deepest spinel in the middle. Plagioclase is shallowest, but there's very little. Mineralogically, the mantle is stratified. If you recall this on test, you'll be gratified. Even deeper in the mantle, there is bridgmanite, which has a denser structure than orthopyroxene. It's also called perovskite. Okay, let's have a couple questions here. First, spinel group minerals can occur with which of these following minerals? And the answer is olivine. Remember, spinel's in the middle, so it doesn't form in the transition zone, it certainly doesn't form in the core, and it doesn't form in the deep mantle. Okay, there's another question about spinel group minerals. Now this one is a little trickier, but it, they contribute to the formation of basalt. And so remember that in mid-ocean ridges where upwelling occurs, melting is relatively shallow, not as shallow as plagioclase peridotites, but certainly within the realm of spinel peridotites. And of course, the melting of the mantle is what creates basalts, typically in the spinel peridotite field. I hope this lecture allows you to understand some of the basic mechanisms for producing basaltic liquids by partial melting of the mantle. Thanks.